Welcome to another Round the Rotary with me, your host, J.P. Warren. And before we get kicked off, I want to say that Round the Rotary podcast is brought to you by Capital Patron Consultants. CPC specializes in project engineering and well site supervision in all disciplines of the oil and gas industry. Contact us through www.capitalpatronconsultants.com to see what CPC can do for you today. And today in the studio, I guess you can call this a studio. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a room with some oh, fun. It counts, it counts. Yeah, it counts, it counts. So um, today in the studio, we have John Hammond, the executive sales manager of drilling, ser- at, in, of drilling services at Tally Energy Services. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming in uh, and doing this podcast. I'm stoked to be here. I, I've listened to a lot of your episodes. I think it's a, it's a great podcast. Well, I appreciate that. I'm kind of excited about this one because I, I think you and I were talking. Uh, before uh, before we actually met up and just kind of bounce some ideas because uh, I, I, I've enjoyed kind of going off script a little bit the mm-hmm. past couple of uh, podcasts and kind of getting to various other in, uh, interests of, 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 my, of my guest here so I'm kind of excited with what we're going to talk about today because it's a lot of random stuff but uh, <laughs> it's pretty relevant to what's going on right now that's 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 on brand for me I'm a bit known to be a bit random really but, yeah got a lot of useless information but that works though yeah it's great for jeopardy yeah <laughs> it, 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 it works so let's like let's do this let's do the normal thing tell us about yourself okay first though I just want to say you, you do have the coolest intro and outro music of any podcast in the oil and gas really world. I think it's cool man. that is really my good. wife is it yeah, yeah my wife's a musician and uh kudos to her it's really good and she was uh, just kind of uh, I mean that's some of her uh, original music is it really I, yeah and oh, I want I mean, if you do a podcast, you got to get, like, the intro and outro song, like, the artwork and all that stuff, and, and I was like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm married to you, so I might as well just use your stuff. So. Hey, man, it's good. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that. So, let's uh, just, so you're into that kind of music. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all kinds of music, but but in particular, that it just, I don't know, it, it fits, it, it works with the podcast thing very well. Well, I appreciate yeah. that. I'm sure she'll listen. Uh, she'll say thank you. <laughs> I think she listens. We'll see. Then. We'll see. So give us a little background on yourself before you, uh, before you uh, into the good stuff. Sure. Uh, so I grew up here in Houston. Um, uh, went to college at the University of Texas, okay. uh, Austin, and um, started as a, uh, well, I was originally going to be a, I wanted to be in, in uh, astronomy. I was interested in space and that kind of stuff, and my dad stopped me and said, John, don't do that. He well, said, uh, he goes, uh, don't do what I did and study things that you're interested in. He goes, go to college, you're going to go to college, go get a marketable skill and study the stuff that you're interested in on your own time. What would, you, what would your dad uh, study the, that? Well, he's got a, like a degree in uh, psychology and a, a master's in music. Okay. And he says, so he says, like, I'm very, like, on paper, I'm very well educated, but it's not really worth the whole lot, you know, right. to, like a you know, career development. So it was, yeah. you know, so I was like, all right. And so I switched from, uh, from that to engineering and it was a much, uh, obviously much harder, much uh, bigger grind, but it was, in the end, it was really uh, worthwhile because it gave me an opportunity to get into oil and gas, and uh, that's been a. It was not something that I set out to do, but it. I kinda well, why, why oil and gas? I mean, you first generation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay, yeah. so I mean, how did oil and gas? I guess the industry kind of uh, draw you into it. Well, it, it may be in a way that kind of you relate to it. It was the, the uh, when I graduated, Slumberjay offered me an opportunity to go uh, abroad straight away. Okay. So I, I, you know, want to travel the world a lot, and uh, and you're young, and you're young, young. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a great, great time to do it. Pre-COVID, big, big world, and uh, lots of stuff to see. And so I was, you know, somebody wants to pay me to go travel around the world. Absolutely, sign me up. I'm, I'm ready to go. And so that was the deal. I, I graduated college and went to uh, live in Aberdeen, Scotland, for four and a half years, working for Slumberjay, working offshore in the North Sea. And holy crap, that was a uh, you know eye-opening experience, a great you know. Horizon expansion, and then when you're in Europe already, if you have time, when you get time off at Slumberjay, which is not all that often, but right. when you do, it's easy to go see a whole lot of other places. And so I got to travel a lot personally, just you know, on vacation and stuff. Oh, around it's Europe. so easy to travel around. Over yeah, there. it's great, right? And so, so how was I mean? So how was that? I mean, I guess going from you know UT, you got an engineering degree, mm-hmm. and your first job is North Sea offshore, right? And I'm I'm a young guy on the rig, and uh, you know, working with a lot of. You know, I, I developed a bad habit of sarcasm. You know, the Scottish are very known for their for their sarcasm. It's a, it's a habit I haven't been able to kick since. So, uh, you know, so that was good. And you know, I remember, it either help you or hurt you. That was right. Uh, so I remember I, I got off the plane my first first uh, day in, in Aberdeen, and, and I was such a green newbie, and um, walking to the uh, to the taxi rank to get in the car, and uh, and obviously I go to the to the side of the car that uh, yeah, nor- normally yeah, the passenger yeah. side, and the, and the taxi driver is the Scottish guy's like. It's okay if I drive, <laughs> you know. And it was like kind of. So that's the first. Yeah, that's my, that's like, how you're welcome. Welcome, to, welcome yeah. to Scotland, right? Yeah. It's okay if I drive. Um, and so, but it was, it was a tremendous experience. Great people. Uh, Abbey is, is a really cool town, um, and you you know you get handed a lot of responsibility, a lot of opportunity early on, and it's uh, and it's a uh, sink or swim, and learn fast, and, and I I did it, do well in those kind of situations, and so it was a great experience for me, and I learned a ton, and. Um, and then after that, my time in, in Aberdeen, I got transferred down to Brazil. And, still with uh, Slumberjay. Still with Slumberjay, okay. yeah. Yeah, doing the uh, wireline. I was a wireline engineer. So okay. Log, logging wells, logging deep water wells, um, all mostly open hole stuff, exploration type stuff. And uh, um, Brazil was like the completely other end of the spectrum, right? Uh, 
uh, North Sea, Scotland is a very high tech, you know, organized, yep. you know, efficient place. And, uh, and Brazil is a bit more kind of wide open, but more, this is like the, the, the pre salt exploration days of, uh, you know, 2005, 2006. Okay. So it was a kind of the wild west a little bit. There was just, you know, they, they, these huge discoveries that Pedro Ross was, uh, was finding offshore Brazil. And so we were doing these huge uh, logging operations on you know, deep water drill ships. And it was just a, man, I mean, it was just really cool. Like, just a really cool. So, how long are you in Brazil for? Almost three years. Okay. I was living in Macaé. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, we're going offshore to the rigs and, and going in and out of Rio and stuff a lot, too. Which rigs were you, were you going? Uh, well, let's see. I spent almost a year of my life on the uh, the West Polaris for, okay. for ExxonMobil. Okay. Um, that was one I spent a lot of time on, and, and, and then really just a whole lot of different rigs. Okay. Like Petrobras, is, they, you know, they had, I think at the time, they had something like 20 rigs operating, and then you, you'd kind of go back and forth a bunch of them. So I saw a lot of different rigs. So you were you, you were living out of Macaé? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. So it's. I mean, it's hard work. You know, you're you're working your butt off. You're you're spending you know 12, 16 hours in the base getting the getting equipment ready to go out, and then the next day you're shipping off early in the morning to go catch a helicopter out to the rig, and then you're working your tail off the whole time you're there, and then you get back and you gotta clean it all up and get your reports done, and everything like that, and just start repeat. Repeat. Just watch repeat. Yeah. Repeat. So I mean, you know, it, it was a grind, but at the same time, you know, I fell in love with Brazil. It's a tremendous right. country. The food, the people, the, food the weather. Is so good. It's so good. It really is, man. It's like. Rice and black beans and the, and the uh, vinaigrettes. It's like it's like basically like Brazilian pico de gallo. Put that all together and then they have the stuff called farofa, which is like uh, it's this manioc flour that they like deep fried in bacon grease and it's mm-hmm. like they call it beach. It's like it's like the texture of beach sand. But yeah. Put on top of that stuff and it's man, it's just oh, it's like. Can it's you fun. find any good Brazilian food here in Houston? You can, yeah, yeah. There's actually a pretty strong Brazilian community. Okay, for sure. Yeah. All no, right. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, so uh, so Brazil is a great experience. Uh, and then I got transferred back to Houston um, to work in the Slumber Day Product Center uh, doing uh, kind of. Tech support and R and D development for uh, wireline tools. And so, it was, was, did you want to be transferred back to, to Houston? No, it was just kind of time. Yeah, you know, it was like there's seven years. You've been out, yeah, you've been out the field seven years. years. It's kind of time to transfer transition to that to the next thing. And uh, and then you know it, by by being in Brazil, I had a lot of you know, operational experience with certain kinds of tools that were was where I got transferred to to work on the R and D and the tech support for those tools. Okay. So, okay. Um, it, and it turned out not to be a good fit for me because I went from that sort of high energy, uh, you know, high stress, exciting world of getting tools and daily operations, and, daily operations and yeah. getting out of the rig and being, you know, being the guy driving the bus kind of thing. And then you get to find myself in an office uh, solving problems by email, you know, <laughs> or text, ex- text more tickets and stuff like that. Excel spreadsheets right, more than yeah. anything, yeah. Um, so uh, it, I came across these guys and I, I ended up leaving Slumber to join a, a consulting firm called uh, Quad Operations, which is. As we, kind of, we were talking about, it's very similar to, to what you guys do, except which, uh, with a much more sort of geological, sort of petrophysical slant. Okay. And so, you know, I did that for seven years and kind of traveling around. And uh, well, how did you get teamed up with them? Um, so the, the the year that I spent on the West Polaris working for Exxon, uh, the Wellside geologists on that on that rig, obviously, you spend a lot of time on the rig, you get to know people, and I got to know those guys. And um, they actually said, "Hey, man, uh, uh, QO is looking for some people who you know know Brazil, who can speak Portuguese." Were, you know, they wanted to kind of grow their their footprint in Brazil because Brazil was at the time was just you know blowing up, you know, yeah. just blowing up. And yeah. I said, so the option was okay, I can sit here and do uh, tech support tickets and uh, you know sit in the office in Houston, or I can you guys you mean you're gonna pay me to travel back and forth to Brazil on a regular basis and try to grow a business and see if I can be a sales guy? And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And so that's that's. that's so wait, were you ever in sales before? Never, no, I'm never in sales. Well, I'm, no, no, not really. No, I'm so well, we're all in sales. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all in, right. we're, every person's in sales. You're, you're always you're selling, selling yourself. And, and, and that was true because you know when you're a wireline engineer for Slumberjay, you know part of your compensation is a percentage of the ticket. So if you can upsell uh, the customer on a on a better technology or whatever, you know, it has a certain right. sales element to right. it, right? But it's certainly not a sales job. So it was, yeah, it was definitely my first attempt at, at sales. That's got to be such a challenge going from you know, I mean, you're, you're in North Sea, you're in you're in Brazil, then you go to Sugarland, Sugar yes, yeah, Sugar yeah. yep. and uh, then suddenly it's like, okay, well, I'm going to take this job in sales for an international, not an international company, but on an international road to assignment, whatever that yeah. is. Conducting sales in a different culture. I mean, that's got to be kind it, of maybe changing. on paper it sounds like that, but it was it was really a pretty easy decision just because I I liked Brazil so much. Yeah, and it was an opportunity to go and, and maintain my you know exposure, my keep practicing yeah, my relationships, which you've been doing there for Absolutely. three years. Yeah, yeah I get that. And, and truthfully, even to now, one one of my uh, things I'm most proud of is actually learning Portuguese. Okay, right? and so it was giving me an opportunity to keep keep using it. You know, keep going to Brazil. Keep Keep speaking the language because uh, you don't have as many opportunities here in Houston to do it. But, you still, uh, you still uh, try to. It's very rusty, but yeah, I do yeah, that. I can speak I'm the same it. way. Like yeah. speaking before, I was you know in France. I was right. there for about a year, so I got pretty conversational with uh-huh. it. You know, I've been back here since '05. 
and I just went over there for uh, for my honeymoon in yep. December, and then it just kind of picked up again. That's cool. Just yeah. start blowing and going, dude. Right. Impressing yeah. the impressing the old lady. Absolutely, it's it, people like because it, it, they don't expect it. You know, yeah. Look, when you look like you and I do, it's they don't expect it to be multilingual. Right. Right? It's a uh, and and you actually I think you get a, we get we get an unfair amount of uh, praise. Uh, for it, right? There's plenty of people who speak five, six, seven languages. No big deal, but but for some reason, American speaking. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly American right. speaking. Right. Language, like, wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Brazilians are so they're so uh, warm and, and and patient. They're like, oh, your Portuguese is so good. And, and I know it's terrible, right? But but they like they encourage it because they want you to. Yeah. yeah. No, it's just like I mean, being you know, people are like, oh, you know, French people this. I'm like, wait, I'm, everyone I've dealt with has been very friendly. Same for me. So yeah. uh, I mean, I equate it to like you know, imagine being here. You know, and you and you waiting on someone them just speaking their native tongue, not uh -huh. even trying. Like I, I understand the, the, the rudeness. We judge those people. If they yeah, did, yeah. Right? I mean, you know, we're doing we're doing this. That's same right. Thing. That's right. Yeah. yeah so we learn sensitivity or we learn the yeah. foreign language. We keep it up for our street cred. Absolutely. Street That's exactly cred. right. Absolutely. So you got this job. You now you're in sales for this consultant's company. So mm -hmm. you're uh, you're rotating out of Brazil. Well, uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a fixed rotation, but it was a, lo a lot of travel down there. Okay. Time down there. You know, cultivating relationships and and you know selling consultants. Did you enjoy that? I did. I really did, and and, and I found that, that I, that's kind of really discovered where I, I like sales. I like the. I've always liked to kind of debate and discuss, and so I like. And then there's a certain element of sales. If I can convince you of our perspective, it's a smart perspective, then you'll buy our product. Right. If I pick up our service. I, I enjoy that part of it. Right. I enjoy the kind of the the win of it. Yeah. 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 Something about that is, is is appealing, and then I also like the notion of you know the with with sales and commission based kinds of things that you know. There's no limit to. There's no theoretical limit to. to yeah, the potential's there. Right. If you want to put in the work, if you want to be successful, if you're smart, if you got a good, good, good product, you got a good pitch, you got a good, you know, customer service, good follow up. That you know, you can be successful. You yeah, know, you can make a lot of money. And so uh, that, that, that was a. And also, the, just the guys at the consulting firm that I work with, they were all great guys, and it was just a, it was really good. It's, it's, it's it, it, it changes everything when you work with a good team. It, it makes it makes a huge difference, and, and it was such you know that consulting business is such a people business. Yeah. That uh, you know it, it, that's the people are so important. And yeah. I, I believe that's true no matter what kind of technology you're talking about or whatever. But there's still it's the, the people, people behind it. it you, need the, you need the you need the, the the people element absolutely to everything. So okay. you're doing this. You're in Brazil. Then you're going back and forth. You're yep. And then and then well, so it's, what started off as a you know Brazil business development role kind of expanded and. It, 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 Involving sort of a global reach and traveling to a place like Southeast Asia, traveling to Europe a lot, um, traveling all over South America, and it just you know essentially anywhere that people might need a geologist or a petrophysicist or a poor pressure scanner or a geosteer or whatever. What a cool job, right? Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> a, I mean, really was. I mean, I, you know, you, you know, you got some time in the industry, you know, mm -hmm. and the next thing you know, it's like, hey, not just you know, we want to go to Brazil, but we want to go globally. Yeah, it was like, well, you got a good idea? Do you see an opportunity? Do you see a market? Yeah, go after it, right? And uh, you know, kind of what we talk about. In this, in the the pre-COVID world, we would travel long distances to go sit face to face and yeah. meet with people and, and and talk and talk about what we're doing, give our you know explain our experience, explain our value proposition, all those kinds of things, and 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 I just I, I really enjoy that. That charges my batteries, you know, when you when you have a good interaction with a with a potential customer or you have uh, you know you get good feedback from existing customers and all that kind of stuff. Like it's a uh, and dude, it's so different right now. With, it really with is Zoom calls and these virtual tours, and we were talking about that before we got on, like. You get charged up being around people. I do too. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. it's just there's a certain uh, element that uh, you know when you're around someone face to face mm -hmm. these days, mm -hmm. and it feels and it feels great. Yeah. It feels great being around people now. To call it energy sounds a little too like you know, you know, hippy dippy, but, you know, but let's call it. Energy. But it is. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you know, at this point, who, who gives a shit? Let's That's call right. it. It's energy. The energy's good, right? Yeah, yeah I completely so. agree with that. <laughs> yeah, so I got to you know, and, and so just in sort of the I guess the theme of my. Oil field careers it gave me an opportunity to travel a lot and see a lot of different places and you know Southeast Asia and China and right. all, like really cool spots yeah you know? absolutely and and there you're not going to the touristy towns you're going to the places where like real life happens right you know, oh that's so, the thing people are like yeah I'm going to Brazil you know all the so, oh I'm going to Rio you're like no no I'm flying in going three you know, three miles yeah three hours to that's right okay. completely different, different. Thing. Yeah. completely different but it's real it's a real place yeah, yeah. there's real people that yeah. are working in uh, you know it's not it's not the Disneyland um, of of yeah. travel it's not it's not a tourist destination right right. Yeah. So, so over the course of that that period working at, at Quad Operations, uh, a, a group of guys in the company uh, basically started a, a software business. Okay. Um, and it was called Dynaview, and we were initially using it to support our consulting business. It's a fantastic, you know, three D software that does three uh, D modeling. You can use it for geomechanics and pore pressure and and geo steering, and it's you know, predictive capabilities. Look ahead a bit, and it's this great tool right. that initially we built kind of to use internally to support our consulting business. But they got to a certain point where we're like, you know, this is actually really pretty good, and we should put we we should Try to put this on the market, and so we did. Right, and uh, we had some early success, some traction, picked up some customers, and had some you know some good uh, 
early adopters of, of kind of what we're doing because it was sort of a different different approach. Um, and I basically said to the guys, I said, look, you know, we're we're kind of doing this, uh, you know, in parallel. It's a sort of a, a side hustle, almost so to speak. And I was like, we, we really should go try to, you know, raise some investment capital and see if we can't, you know, turbocharge this thing and make it really go and see if right. we, see we can go with it, right? Yeah. And so um, I basically kind of went on the Shark Tank, you know, fundraising uh, tour. I found myself in Shark Tank rooms on, on a regular occasion where I'm sort of pitching our software and looking so at investment. So that's investments. a completely different level. Completely different. Right? Yeah. Well, it was, at, but so much fun. Not um, a bad one. Pressure's not bad. No. Uh, I, I I tend to enjoy that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, okay. I, like, I like the challenge of it. I like the you know the, I don't know the competitive element. Yeah, I guess. And so that was a really and, and also you realize it's you have to have a, a thick skin because I, I was telling somebody the story the other day. You know, I, I went in and I was kind of pitching to this uh, what I didn't, I didn't know at the time because I was so ignorant about how fundraising works, how it and, works. The, and the yeah, different yeah. different tiers of companies and what size of, of investment checks yeah. you want to write. And, you know, we're this little fledgling software company, and I'm sitting across from a guy who's a, a VC, and I'm telling my story. He's like, yeah, that sounds really cool, John, but, uh, you know, how much are you looking to raise? Like, yeah, a small number. And he's like, well, you know, we're really only writing about checks about $25 million or more. You know? oh. And, and, oh. And, 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 like... Can I, can I have a little bit of that? <laughs> right. Can I have a, but, a, a pinch? Yeah, but, it, but if, I, if I'd been smarter, if I'd known more, I would have been... I, would have, I, I should have known that ahead of time, but it was like... But he was a very gracious guy, and, uh, you know, he... Very polite, and it was a, well, lots of those kinds of meetings, right? Yeah. You go to the next one, you go to the next one, and it's kind of an accumulation of information as you go through. And you're learning, and, and you're learning, time, and, yeah. and stubbing your toe, and making a fool of yourself to a certain extent, but also learning, and, and so that each time the next one gets better and better and better. And so then finally, we got uh, invited to the uh, Rice Alliance. Uh, Rice University has this thing called the Rice Alliance. It's like a partnership with uh, Rice University and uh, the tech companies, okay. investment and funds here in Houston, and they put on this uh, this form every year, and uh, where tech companies get to present their technology and. Uh, to a room full of potential investors, industry folks, and um, and they also did this speed dating event. And I've never done a speed dating thing okay. before. And so it was like, it's basically the day before. It's a great two for one offer, right? Holy there. man, it, it, I mean, new tech, you know, absolutely. Get a girlfriend, <laughs> boyfriend, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and so I had this uh, this sort of dance card, and it had 10 slots on it, and it, it's basically 10 10 minute intervals. And we basically, you know, the bell rings, and you go to the first table, and I sit across from a, you know, a couple of people who are from. You know, GE investments yeah. or Statoil investments or you know whoever, and they're who are there looking for new technologies and stuff. And you basically go have ten minutes to go and kind of give your pitch. pitch for ten minutes, and then the bell goes ding, and you get up and you do it again, and you do it ten times in a row. And by the end of it, I was just like, you know, fuck. Well, you got to be engaged every time. Oh yeah, but it's but and it, and you're you know you're yeah. energy, you know, it's trying to get energy. energy, trying to get your point across, yeah. trying to you know, and I, I have a I told myself I was going to try not to talk too fast. I have a real real bad. I, I, uh, well, I interrupt, so it's that's okay. good. It's probably good. It slow me down a little bit. But um, uh, so so the, the speed dating thing, you got to pitch, you know, our, our software to a bunch of different companies, and then the next day, you get uh, I think it was five minutes or six minutes, something like that, to, to, to do a pitch to the entire you know couple hundred people in, okay. a, in an auditorium and, and give the pitch to everybody, right? So through that process is how uh, we met the Tally Energy Services Company um, because they were they essentially they they Tally Energy it's a great story. They started uh, three years ago, uh, okay. and it's a uh, Guy called Doug Fauche. He's our chairman. He was he used to be the CEO of uh, of El Paso, sort of okay. famous for turning El Paso around. And then our CEO is a really guy called Chris Doros, and then he's had a ton of experience in, in M and A and in oil field technology services. And they wanted to build a a oil field services company that um, really, are, to, to put it most simply, our our motto is we want to make better wells. Okay. So they, they you know they identified lots of issues um, with efficiencies that that stem from individual incentives not aligned and not really looking at the whole picture and how can we better take the data from the drilling process and integrate it with the geology and how we can take that data from the well placement and integrate it with the completions and how do we take that data and then so it's really it. just kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's a way to dilute information so everyone understands what everyone's working with and helps drive people and, and understand what motivates uh, people's projects right but also with a focus on how do we help our customers make a better well let's not just sell them new technology for new technology sake because because our tool is better than their tool. It's shinier, it's, yeah. Or shinier, yeah. faster, yeah. Yeah. whatever. Let, what, let's really look at this from the standpoint of a customer and say, how do we help them make better wells, right? And that's the and, and that really kind of resonated with me and resonated with our team. And uh, you know, we weren't looking to be acquired; we were looking to raise money. But you know, the, the tally model was like, well, they, they kind of said, you know, look, we're we're willing to invest, but really, our business model is we want to buy and build. We want to okay. buy companies and put, put them together into a, a, a a complementary and comprehensive portfolio that that helps deliver on the promise of making better wells. That's and cool. So yeah. So that, in the end, it was actually the right. I think it was the right choice for us to, rather than try to invest and, and grow grow the company, or rather than take on investment, I should say, uh, and try to grow the company. That actually we you know so Tally acquired us in uh, twenty eighteen. I believe. And this was a side. This was still kind of a side. Yeah. At the new stages of saying, hey, maybe we can do something with 
Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay, that's that's pretty interesting. It was. There was a lot, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of moving parts going on, but it was, you know, it was. I, I think for us it was good timing. You know, at the at the time, you know, the market was kind of on an upswing. And okay. We were in a positive, uh, positive motion, and so it's been a so so basically we got acquired by Tally, and just a little bit about the Tally story is that you know they ra- they raised a bunch of money, um, okay. one hundred eighty million dollars, I think, something like that, all, all told. Um, our, our primary investors are Red Bar- Redbird Capital, or Great, great uh, uh, business partner right. for us, okay. and um, they, they they have the you know, I think they have, the vision seems to be from where I can tell people much wiser than me who set the company up and set the investment structure up. It, it's it's extremely well incentivized. It's, the, the alignment is strong, and, and just the whole business process, the whole business model, like just it, it's really smart. So that's I, a, I mean, that's also probably has a good a, a good feeling working at a company. Yeah, like that. and not only is it the incentives match up, but it's they respect the people. Then it's uh, the, you have the entire board. Online division, absolutely the same step, and that's harder than you think, right? It yeah. sounds like it'd be simple to do something like that, but really, it's a lot harder than I think. And, and they've just really done a great job of, of doing that. Okay. Um, so we're we're really delighted to be part of the, the tally group, and so um, you know, and, and specifically work in the tally drilling services division. So tally has three three divisions: we have tally drilling, tally completions, and tally production. Okay. So the the tally drilling services where I work every day is uh, the you know the flagship company is, is Premier Directional. Okay. Right? So they acquired Premier Directional in twenty seventeen. And they acquired a, a motor company um, in twenty, I guess later in twenty seventeen, early twenty eighteen, um, and uh, then Dynaview Software, and so we kind of put the the established brand of you know Premier Directional and their right. uh, these uh, tools that they already own, the, a motor manufacturing and engineering company, and then some cool software that sort of stitches it all together, and that's kind of the the bundle. And the people, and and then all the people that are associated. Well, with there's it. some great people that we use at the company. Uh, That's right. I mean, yeah. you, you know, we kind of it's six degrees of separation, or I think yeah. oil fit is like three degrees these days, maybe even less. Yeah. Uh, as, as the oil fit seems to be getting smaller and smaller, right? Um, but it's uh, you know it, it's exposure to a lot of other cool technologies. You know the and people that have a lot of huge track record in specifically in the U.S. space, and so it's so so far it's been a really good uh, really good fit for us. And, and uh, I guess over the two years since we uh, since we joined Tally. Uh, Started off as the software kind of geo guy, and, okay. and uh, last year I, I was I had the opportunity to be kind of looking after the the sales team for, oh, for okay. the service group. So we're selling directional drillers. We're selling. Uh, how are you, how are you finding uh, being over the sales uh, team? Uh, <laughs> during, we're we're uh, recording this right now, at the end of uh, September. How are you finding uh, being over the sales team during, during these times? It's tough, man. It's a it's a grind, right? It's a grind, especially because like we were talking about earlier that. Without the, you know, sales is always going to be a grind. You're, you're, you get a lot of no's, you know, you're, you're, oh, yeah. you're not everybody is, is as wild by your sales pitch as you think they should be, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. they don't recognize the brilliance that's, that's baked within it, right? They don't want to hear half the shit I have to say anyway. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, uh, but, but you, you get your bad, you know, you get that recharge when you, when you have the good, when you yeah. have, when the, when the, when the light bulb goes off or when the, you know, when you, when you realize that kind of what you're saying is, is getting picked up and it's appreciated and then when it turns into actual, Productive work and Results people are see, people measure. are out people are out of the rig and they're you know like that's a very satisfying thing. Oh yeah, it works right and so it doesn't take a whole lot to kind of keep you coming back. It's like, I think it's kind of like golf, right? I'm a terrible golfer, but oh, you hit that like hit that one, one and it just hit that one pure right. shot. And it's, it just keeps you coming back. Yeah, so sales is kind of similar, right? That's a good point. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So so it's been it's been a challenge, you know, especially without being able to have that kind of those face to face meetings and having so they're trying to adjust and, and the uncertainty with forecasts and planning and. What's the activity going to look like? And, and so, how are you? How are you navigating through that? I mean, we, you just mentioned that you know the oil field's getting smaller and smaller. I mean, not just through connections and LinkedIn and, and you know different people knowing it, but I mean the oil field is getting smaller and smaller through the consolidations, people being let go. I mean, how do you view that as kind of a a challenge or not an opportunity? I hate saying that, but uh, I mean, how do you see that in the great uh, crew change that you uh, that mm. you discussed with me earlier? I, well, I think the answer is yes. Okay, <laughs> let's move on to the next question. The next question is <laughs> no, uh, uh, you're right. I mean, there, there, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a necessary evil. You know, you, we don't want it, to. It's maybe uncomfortable to talk about, but that there, there has to be some consolidation, and unfortunately, that means that there's going to be people who we used to work with who we don't work with currently, or, right. or you know, it, it just, it's just a, unfortunately, it's a sort of a necessary component of what we're going through right now with in the you know, oil and gas business. Um, the, the positive spin of that is that. As long as we're staying solvent, staying staying active, that whenever we get to the other side of this, whenever that might be, we'll be riding we'll, the wave. We'll be riding the wave, right? You know, you know, and but you got to pat you got to paddle ahead of time to catch that wave. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's not one of those things that you hear about a customer picking up a rig or a flag a frack fleet and you just start calling them Ben. No. this is just months and right. prep for. Right. But it's not so much the, the the you know we've. 
I got in the oil field in 2005, and you always hear about the great crew change. You know, the, that's when the you know, there's mm -hmm. people that are, you know, 20 years, you know, there's no one between your age right. and 20 it's years ago. Yeah. And that really hasn't happened yet. I mean, you still, you still see that. But I think right now, through everything going on with, you know, uh, COVID and the demand, the price of oil, you're getting all this older, the, the older right. generation kind of forcibly pushed out mm -hmm. of the industry, which, you know, is good and bad. Um, you know, obviously it's not good when people, you know, lose, lose their jobs. It also opens up for opportunity. But also another thing that's kind of, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, but you're also getting a lot of the younger generation, those people with, you know, 18 months or less in the oil field that want a career in the oil field that are getting let go too. Mm. So it's, it, you're kind of faced with a couple, uh, you know, a double, a double yeah. hit. And, uh, you know, obviously in the only gas industry you want to retain and, and, and foster the growth of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's tough right now. It really is. No, it's a good point. I, I, I'd always been kind of focused on, and it's, I don't, somebody much smarter than me, and I don't remember who it was where I heard it, but they talked about how, you know, COVID hasn't really changed anything. It's just accelerated yeah. sort of trends that were maybe already in, in motion. Right. And and so that, to the point, I've been hearing about the great change for years and years, and I feel like we just haven't seen it. It's, it. But it's now being accelerated, it certainly seems like. You know, but but you make a really good point that actually the, the, the same is true for the for the, the younger half of that of that. Uh, population because you're right they're like man there's a lot of volatility here geez we've had two downturns in three years you know? yeah so that like, sucks like <laughs> you know I'm on, I've yeah. been here and I've been here so months. It, I heard that there's a lot of drilling engineers that are going to work for Amazon yep Amazon um, there's a lot of uh, what else there's a lot of, like not Matt maybe NASA too like there's a lot of like or like a, you know engineer company that uh -huh. does work yep. for NASA yeah. Yeah. a lot of people are leaving the industry yeah no, well, I mean which you know, I get it. I mean, it's it's it is volatile. I mean, we haven't really recovered from twenty fifteen. Uh, not really, no. not really. Yeah. And then next thing you know, we get hit with this negative thirty seven dollar oil. Right. We don't know when things are going to turn around. Right. And we talked about that. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we can. A lot of podcasts, you know, they'll, they'll do this demand line. You know, like, well, let's forecast what's going to happen in Q two. Right. I don't know that. I don't either. I don't either. I I don't either. If I if I did, I want to be doing this. Well, well, and I think anybody that says they know is either what's that? They're they're lying or they're selling something to you. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, no one knows. Yeah. No one knows right now. Yeah. But that's the thing, though. That, that's something that people I think probably need to to start thinking about a little more serious. It's like, hey, look, if we are letting people go, like we probably need to identify a couple young people, with not a, not a lot of experience, and kind of be their mentor and kind yeah. of bring them up through. Well, so I think that's that's the thing you, you make a good point. I think you know mentorship is such an important part of just people's development, but it's, it's like an important component of an industry in general, yeah. is that especially you know, as, as the older guys are retiring, that, that, that there is there a vacuum of mentorship? And so I, I think it's, a, it's potentially a, a really big issue. Yeah, I think that's a big issue, but another thing that these young people are coming into, they, they're having a huge grasp of knowledge of the software and technology that's out there. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the older generation doesn't have. Right, and then the older generation complained that, well, these, these young guys, well, they can work the computer really good, but do they really understand the first principles behind what the software is telling them? That's true. There's that joke about, you know, computer says no, so uh, <laughs> yeah. it must be no. Yeah. But wait a minute, do you understand why? You know, those kinds of things. So there's that, that balance between uh, understanding the, the fundamentals uh, and then can you handle the game, but also can you adapt to the, the new technology, the new developments, and the way we communicate, and right. the way we, you know, all this you know, analytics and machine learning and all these kinds of things. It's, uh, Which has been pretty, a spotlight's been on that stuff right now. Yeah. Data, data, data analytics, all this new software. Mm -hmm. right? We talked about Corva uh, a couple podcasts ago. Yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting stuff out there it really right now. No, pretty really high-tech really. stuff. So how has your sales methods, I guess, changed? Uh, I mean, I guess how are they going to change moving forward? I and mean, we don't have to talk about how they have changed because... No, I mean everyone kind of. Well, still, you know, yeah. No, I, well, I'll, get, I'll give you one example. So, uh, you know, we last year we invested over ten million dollars in our facility uh, here in Houston. So, with this beautiful six thousand square foot uh, manufacturing repairment facility, okay. where, where it's our kind of our main HQ, and we're, we're we put a lot of effort into it. The guys take an immense, uh, an immense amount of pride in keeping it organized and clean and smooth and running. And so we were uh, always it felt like it was a good, uh, you know, sales. Yeah, you know, like to get people in. Hey, come check out, come check out our yeah, yeah. See, see where the you know see where the magic happens. See what we're doing. That's, uh, come see our tools. Meet the people who are working on the equipment. Meet the people who are in charge of the you know, operations. Brings them right? into your house. Let's know who you are. Absolutely. Yeah, I get that. And it's a you know it's, it's been a very successful sort of uh, approach for us. Well, obviously that doesn't work with in the COVID world. Yeah. So uh, we we made a high resolution three D scan of the entire. Uh, facility. So actually, uh, uh, Mike Kennedy, who I, we, we both, yeah. uh, he's the president of Premier Directional, uh, his wife is a super smart uh, technical lady and she has this amazing camera and she brought it in and it does this like, you know, she set it up and it goes and it does these uh, these sort of 3D scans. Really? And we have this amazing 3D 
uh, interactive 3D web-based uh, tour that you can do. So I, I can I can invite you to a tour without having. Oh, to... look! Yeah, I want to check that it's out. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah it's really absolutely. Cool. So it's been a great tool for us to like. You know, if you're on a you know a Zoom call or Teams or whatever, you can actually give someone a tour and talk them through. Say, hey, look, this is the machine where we cut these pieces. This is where we do this maintenance. This is where the MWD, equip MWD equipment is. Uh, this is our command center. See, here's all. You know, these were our guys. I mean, that's first off, that sounds pretty amazing. That it's pretty fantastic. fantastic. That, that sounds pretty. Fantastic. Have you? Are you able to like measure? I guess the success rate. I guess if it's people clicking on. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can track who you people visit. How many okay, people cool. take tours themselves? Yeah. Real neat. So they can they can walk wander around if they want to to their heart's content. Um, on their own, or we can do a guided tour and talk, click them through it, and you know, you, it's really cool. You just walk down the hall and like just you kind of click the mouse, and it takes you around. Like Google Maps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 going inside and uh, and seeing around, and you can like kind of look up and look down and around and, and check it all out. It's really fantastic. That's pretty neat. That's, that's pretty interesting. So you went, you first went to school. I want to come kind of into the stuff that kind of interests you right now. So okay. you went to school first to. To be an astronomer? Well, I, I just I didn't know what I wanted to do. But you, was, but you enjoyed space. I was super interested in space. Are you, you still know? interested in space? Still am. I, I, I was riveted by the whole SpaceX, you know, launch to the space station and all that kind of stuff. I was, you know, my, my kids were unimpressed with how excited I was about it. Right. Like, what's the big deal, you know? But uh, and then probably my favorite movie of all times is the I don't know if you've seen it. It's, it's called Apollo. It's the it's a documentary. And it's basically stitched together all the uh, original footage of the Apollo Eleven moon landing. Okay. In color. Like they they can make these these black and white videos now these original black and white well, films. Wasn't and they, there like a, they shall never grow old that Peter the World War One Peter Jackson movie where they yes they took all the S black and white and similar thing color. yeah and it's just like I mean I, for me it was just like whoa I mean it just completely changes the whole thing and it and it you know I mean the Apollo Eleven thing was it's just it's cool on its own but then when you see it in color and the way that the the story is put together I mean it's just it's not as as distant correct as it, it feels yeah. more real I, yeah it's a yeah so. Uh, I, I'm that kind of stuff. I'm just I'm, I'm all about it. Right? So are you excited where we're at right now? I guess I'm with everything. The very space? very excited. I think you know, he's a bit he's a bit crazy, but I think Elon Musk is cool. I I, I really appreciate his ambition. Okay. You know, like, right. Let's go to Mars, right? Um, yeah. Let's go to let's go to the moon. Like all these kind of things. I think it's a. Uh, there's maybe for all of our technology and all our developments and social media and the internet and the fact that you can you know order whatever you want on your phone yeah. and it gets delivered the next day. All that's tremendous technology, but it's like it's not the Frontier. You it's know not mean? pushing. It's it's it's, it's, uh, it's speeding up the current technology, right. but it's not it's not pushing the boundaries. Right. Right. And so I'm fascinated by these you know these big ambitious projects where yeah you know what we're gonna do we're gonna go fly out to that rock that's uh, you know thousand miles away and we're gonna land on it you know walk around a little bit and come back <laughs> and then we're gonna land and we're gonna then we're gonna land and we're gonna land and that's amazing that's up, those videos of the the rockets like landing back and all that kind of stuff just uh, it just it fascinates me so so, so we talked so we talked about this a little bit a little uh, the the, the the private space travel uh -huh. right, from like either New York to Paris or LA to New mm -hmm. York or Houston to Concord on steroids. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. It takes like what thirty minutes yeah. to go places. Yeah. And, and you brought up the interesting idea of uh, if that stuff becomes kind of regular. I mean, why not commute? Right. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Why not? You know, commute. Uh, you know, between countries. Have a meeting in London on Tuesday and maybe a meeting in in Macae on Wednesday. <laughs> are you uh, Are you booked up to go on any of these flights? Not yet. Not yet. I need to. Uh, we need the oil price to go up a little bit more. Is that a bucket this time? Oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. Like how? Like how serious could this happen? That that I would do it. Yeah. Well, depending on partly on the being able to afford it. It's pretty spendy right now. It's like I think it's like ten million bucks. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. 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 So pretty, the price either has to come down or uh, you know the price of oil. But that's something that you would do. Absolutely. Okay. Without hesitation. You're watching Cosmos. Yes. Yeah, I like Cosmos. I like the original one too. I, you know, so the thing that really got Carl. me, yeah, Carl Sagan. Yeah. The thing that really got me into it is I read the book uh, Pale Blue Dot. It's a Carl Sagan book, and it basically, it's uh, it's all about how the Earth. You know, we we, we get very uh, you know sort of self absorbed to yeah. some extent, and you realize how small we are. We're just a pale blue dot in this big giant universe, and like it was a kind of a for a, I think I was sixteen or seventeen when I read it. It was like oh, you know, I, blue, you know, I love I love there. seeing how small like you know Earth is insignificant in the, in the, grand, in the grand scheme yeah. of things. I mean, it's one of those things. It's like why am I pissed off about exactly. this? Exactly. Like, it's why a is tremendous this? leveler for like when you're like, man, I just had a crappy you know, sales presentation, yeah. terrible, the customer hated what we had to say and you know, whatever. And oh my God, the oil business is, is in the in the tank right now. But like you realize, just scale out a little bit and realize, you know what? We're going to be okay. Yeah, you know, it's not that significant. I mean, your, your bad day at the grand scheme of things, it's going to be okay. That's right. Life that's goes right. on. Absolutely. And, that's, and on. for me, that's an important thing because it's easy to get kind of, you know, get competitive, get focused and you want to, you know, you know, overanalyze things. Yeah, that's absolutely. That perspective for me is great. Maybe that's what I like about space. I don't know. So what else about space do you enjoy? Um, 
just the, the the sheer vastness of it, I think, you know, the, and the notion that there probably are, you know, I don't know, you believe in aliens? I believe in aliens. I believe in aliens, too. Absolutely. They, I, I think most people do. They're just, the universe is big enough, there's got to be something else. Well, I mean, you run the, I mean, absolutely, I don't know the, the, what that equation is, but you run the numbers, it's going to happen. Yeah, I believe in aliens. Absolutely. Um, I believe in, uh, you know, uh, I'm very interested in uh, parallel universes, you know, multiple mm. dimensions. I can't uh, get my head around, I can't wrap my mind around Simulation around theory? There. I like that one, too. That's cool. I, I made a joke the other day to somebody about uh, how, uh, you know, at least the guy who runs the simulation has a sense of humor, you know. Yeah. Because <laughs> this is crazy. Twenty twenty is crazy. I don't, I, I don't knock it. I yeah. mean, I, I'm, I'm not discrediting uh, it. No. I mean, the, I mean, you see how far you know video games advanced. Oh yeah. Today. Oh my God. My, my son has this uh, VR set. And, oh, uh, the Oculus Rift. Uh, no, he's got. Well, I don't know. It's the. I think it's the X. Whatever the Xbox yeah, yeah, system. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's like, man, you gotta check it out. And I was like, nah, it can't be that 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 cool. And I put it on. I was like, holy smokes! It's it's like, oh my gosh, it really is. Yeah, you know, it's insane. insane. Yeah. So. Uh, but I guess the, the, to me the more interesting question is, we both so we agree that they exist. Yeah. Have we? Do we interact with them? Are they here? Do they have they been here? Have we seen them? Have okay. We, you want to get into this? <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a deep, it's a deep rabbit hole. But. <laughs> all right, look. Here's the deal. So I just watched this. Uh, I don't even. I don't know what this document is called. I think it's called like you know, um, the Disclosure Project or something like that. Right. Okay. I mean, it talks about like you know, like you know, UFOs. You know, the, the government having UFOs and having mm-hmm. the technology. You know, we should be fifty. Uh, Years of more advanced mm-hmm. when it comes to propulsion and all that mm-hmm. stuff, but you know, the government's holding on to it. Right. You know, then they're manufacturing their own UFOs. Yeah. And then it gets to the false flag theory. It's like, what if we do UFO attacks in the States mm-hmm. or wherever, mm-hmm. you know, wherever globally? Mm-hmm. That'll ban everyone behind this common enemy, mm-hmm. which will be, yeah. So it's, I believe in this stuff. It's got many layers, yeah. Yeah, look, if aliens want to, I don't know if they're peaceful. I feel like they're probably peaceful. I mean, with all the sightings of UFOs and all this stuff, look, if they want to destroy us, if they want to come down and kick our ass, I feel like. They probably could pretty easily. Yeah, I think right now they're just kind of observing. I mean, they really haven't. I don't yeah. think they've harmed people. You right. Know, like, well, so uh, uh, you, as a as a podcaster yourself, I'm sure you probably listen to Joe Rogan every once in a while. Not a little bit. A little bit. So he he, he has this theory. I think I don't know if it's his theory, but he talks about how uh, you know the the sightings, UFO sightings, really ramped up after 1945 or whatever. Yeah, 40, yeah 47. His his theory is that. When we detonated the, when we started detonating nuclear bombs, like that, the there's like little spaceman seismographs that are really kicking cool. off, going like, oh, we should oh, go check this. what's yeah. going on over here, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's when they started picking up. Yeah, yeah that was, right. that was yeah. we should start paying attention to these guys. Yeah, because the monkeys have well, now they have nuclear power. Right? Yeah, so no, they're right. blowing each other up. <laughs> right. Yeah, take a step back. Look at the grand scheme of things. <laughs> that's right. That's big of a deal. That's right. They're that's right. guys. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm that stuff. I mean, I've always been fascinated about that. Yeah. So. Um, so space. What are, what are the, what are the uh, things that kind of uh, that that are you passionate about that kind of drive you? Well, this is gonna so people are gonna think I'm crazy. I'm talking about spacemen, and uh, now I'm gonna talk about Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, by the way, I have no idea. No idea. I, I know it's like cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency. If yeah. you want to learn me up on this, do it. I don't. I don't know how good I can do it. I'm, I'm not. I don't have the gift of brevity. I, I, one of the things I think is a pe- genius. People who are real geniuses, they have the ability to sort of distill a lot of information into. Very small, uh, you know, word, very efficient words. Right. I have absolutely do not have that capability at all. Okay. It, it takes me what might take someone five words. It takes me about fifteen or twenty words to, to tell the same amount of information. But essentially, a big, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular is is a it's a system of money. And okay. You first have to start with the concept that money itself is a belief system. Yeah. Right. The the U.S. dollar is not backed by gold or anything. What it used to be. It's it's it is a we. When I when you pay me a dollar I, or I take your dollar, it's because I believe that, that it's worth that it that it's going to be worth something if I go take it somewhere. Right. Else, right? That that that's what and and that belief comes from it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Right. Right. So, um, but as a result of all this you know, financial the, the you know the COVID crisis, all this financial stimulus, there's an enormous amount of money, new money that's being generated generated by the Federal Reserve. So the print it out. That print well there it's. It's not exactly they print it out, but it, but fundamentally they're they're adding to the money supply because okay. in the hopes that it you know will help stimulate the economy, right? And what that does though is you increase the number of dollars in circulation that that decreases the, the value of that dollar, right? And that. this is why lots of people invest in gold and right. in real estate and and collectibles and cars and kind of stuff because they're looking for a place to store that value, right? You worked hard, we you know we worked hard, we started, we grew our business, we brought in some income. We don't want that to just disappear in the form of inflation. Yeah, if the market takes a hit, we're, we're right. next thing you know, we're, we're wiped out. So you want to take that value, you want to put it in something that will store and hold that value. Okay. Right. And so the idea of a cryptocurrency is that it is a cryptographically secured volume of money, or volume, a set amount, set amount, Okay. that will never be exceeded, and so that you have digital scarcity. 
Now the trick here is, and the, and the real kind of the, the magic thing that makes that possible is that with a dollar or a piece of gold, if I give it to you, I can't then give that same piece of gold to someone else. Okay. So uh, in the case of a dollar bill though, you need a bank. You need some sort of central authority that's tracking, okay, uh, JP gave John a dollar and John gave Susie a, a quarter and they kind of track where all those okay. things go. But you, need, but you have to trust that bank that they're, that they're keeping track of everything. The, the beauty of, and, and the reason why you have to have that is because digital, if something's digital, I can replicate it over and over and over again. So the way the cryptocurrency network works is that it solves what's called the double spend problem. It, it, you can cryptographically assure that if I give you a Bitcoin, that I can't give that same Bitcoin to somebody else. Okay. And that's it. That's the whole thing. And that the ledger that tracks all the movements of all the Bitcoins or all the cryptocurrencies is is auditable and open for everyone to check. Instantaneously. Yeah. Instantaneously. Okay. So that's the whole deal, right? So it's it's scarce. Um, it's cryptographic, cryptographically secured with, uh, it's a, I'm going to get way out of my depth and try to talk about how that yeah, works, but it's, but it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that was sort of developed in the, by the, you know, the intelligence agencies and it's now, it's like available to, uh, that, that, that math, that technology is available to us to use. And, and so who's to say that one Bitcoin is worth X amount? Well, that's the thing, it's market. The market is worth as well. Well, who, who accepts Bitcoin? Uh, I, that's a good question. It, it, Part right now, most people who are buying Bitcoin yeah. are doing it for, and this is what's interesting about, uh, that was out in the news a couple weeks ago, is uh, it's not being used for transactions. People aren't buying coffee with it, you know. It's not a, right now it's not considered a, uh, you know, like, yeah, it's currently yeah. a tender. It's right, currently it is a, just a store of value. People are using it, people are buying it and holding it in the, in the, in the beliefs that if I buy it today for $10,000, that uh, it'll be 10 million. Million. It, it, it'll be at least $10,000 or more in right. the future because it's not going to be eroded away in value. Right. Okay. Um, and then, and then the other people who are, doing, who are who are buying it are speculators or traders or trying to you know, they're they're playing the ups and the downs, right? right. But most people who are buying it are using it for storing value. So there's a, a CEO, a guy called Michael Saylor. He's a CEO of a company called MicroStrategy, and he's very famously uh, recently came out and basically they, I think they had five hundred million dollars in cash in their treasury, and he essentially converted uh, four hundred four hundred twenty million of that into Bitcoin, and. It's, bought all this Bitcoin and put it in this cold storage and like he's, because he says like, look, our business generates cash. If I just leave the cash, you know, in our treasury with all this uh, money printing, quantitative easing on stuff, it's just, it's just, just going gonna gonna to eat, gonna eat away at, right. at, at my reserves. So I want to put it in some, and, and he went and looked for all kinds of different things that he could put it into and he just, he decided that, you know, Bitcoin is the right thing. And he's doing it for what he believes is he's being uh, responsible, a responsible fiduciary of his company's, you know, treasury reserves. Now there's a whole lot of other people who think he's absolutely crazy, like that shit crazy. Yeah. They do something like that because because Bitcoin is so volatile, it's so so speculative, and so few people really understand how it works. But I'm fascinated by these kind of things. Yeah, but I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff, right? It's a uh, in the same way that the internet and Amazon changed the way commerce works, right? Do you believe Bitcoin could potentially replace uh, currency? I'm not that crazy. Okay. I think it will. I think it has a role to play. You know, all right. Right now, uh, gold, the market cap of gold is, uh, I think it's like uh, 20 trillion. The market cap of Bitcoin is 200 billion. So oh. there's a big there's a big gap to right. go, right? The market cap of real estate is, I don't know, it's like 200 trillion. Okay. Right? So we're, it's still just a very very nascent tiny asset. But I I kind of think of it as like it's like the it's the money of the internet, right? We all live on the internet. We're we're very with COVID. We hardly go to the restaurants. We hardly, yeah. You know, it, most everything you're ordering like. Commerce on the internet. This is a way for that commerce to work in a decentralized fashion that doesn't require you know you're not reliant on the on the government or the you know, or a central bank to uh, to track the your your value and you can we can trade and, and, and gear, engage in commerce on the internet in a digitally nascent way. So who, who releases more Bitcoin? So the way the, the way the Bitcoin gets added to the system. So the, the 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 hard cap is 21 million. Okay. And the way it works is every 10 minutes, uh, it, all the transactions that occur over that 10 minutes get get locked into a, 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 a mining block, okay? Right? And every time that block gets created, a few new Bitcoins get created. And so uh, right now, it's, I think it's every, and it's every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, about six, I think six and a half Bitcoin, or six and a quarter Bitcoin get created every 10 minutes. That's it. Right, but recently, just in May, uh, was called the halving. So every four years, the amount of the, the mining reward gets cut in half. So prior to May of this year, it was uh, 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes. So every four years, it cuts in half and half and half. And so it's it's the the supply is increasing, but it's increasing in a slower rate. rate. Right. And eventually, I think it's in twenty forty four, twenty one forty four, something like that, is when there will be no more new bitcoins created. They will walk, like reach the twenty one million cap, and that's it. And there won't be any more uh, created. And so, you know, it's a long time in the future, but it's an interesting 
um, you know, this, this sort of parabolic decline of, of new issuance is what gives it that sort of hard you know, scarcity, that, that value that, that people that what people find interesting about. It. John, you just completely just blew me out of the water and talked about 30,000 feet over my head, but I think that's very fascinating. <laughs> it is it's it's fascinating. It, it, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole that, you know, once you start falling down it, it's, uh, there's, because you, because in the process of, of learning about it, you learn about how the Federal Reserve works, you learn about how, you know, how, how the, the currency system works. Currency system general. works, and, and, I, and I was sort of surprised how little I really knew about how it all works. And so when you start kind of kicking over rocks, you grow more rocks, and it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's fascinating stuff. It kind of starts making more sense. It does, it does right? And, and then you see how it fits into oil and gas, right? And so there are companies now, so, so the thing about, about Bitcoin mining, right, is this very secure network that's, that's sort of securing this with the blockchain, right? Okay. Which is this, making sure that everyone agrees that, so all the transactions up to today, we all agree what they were, right? There's no dispute about what it is. So it's, that's, it's called immutable because we all agree. It's, it's unchangeable and it's what we all agree. Um, but there's energy required to run the computers, to run those okay. rigs that, that do all that processing, right? And, back in. And, and that's the reward. That's why the miners the, the, who are securing this blockchain, that's why they get the reward for, for securing a block. That's in exchange for the energy that they're putting into it. To, to do all those calculations, okay. right? That's that's the that's where the mining sort of uh, comparison goes, right? It's, it's called a proof of work. You have to do a certain amount of work processing calculations to secure the blockchain, and then in, re, in, re, in return for that work that you put in, you get a you can earn a, a mining reward in the form of bitcoins, okay. right? So there are companies now. So so one of the competitions is how can you apply more computing power at lower energy cost. To, so that you can compete more aggressively for that those mining rewards. Okay. So there are companies now that are putting out these uh, Bitcoin mining rigs on North Dakota oil fields, and they're utilizing the flare gas. So instead of flaring the gas, they're using it as the source of energy to power their their mining process, their mining computers, so that they're using you know what's otherwise be waste to help process you know power their processors at a at a super low cost. Well, and it allows these North Dakota, and it's primarily North Dakota now, but it's going to expand, I think, in other places. It allows them to reduce the amount of flare gas, so then, because they, there's some sort of some sort of balance between how much you can flare versus how much liquid you can produce. Right. So if you're, you're, if you're repurposing your flare gas and not flaring it anymore, it allows you to produce more liquids. So it's like a, this one symbiotic relationship, right? The one group is using the waste of the other that, that, it, that sort of enhances the efficiency of both systems. Right. And, and I love businesses like that, right? That's yeah. A, it's like they do that. The folks on the ways, and the next thing you know, they're taking the trash and turning it into their treasure. Exactly, pretty much. Yeah, compost into fertilizer. Yeah, you know, there's lots of different examples of that. But I'm fascinated by these kinds of businesses where we're, you know, how, how do we repurpose what's otherwise a waste product and, and turn it into something that's useful? You're seeing a lot of the, the, a lot of conversations about flare and gas. Absolutely, it's a busy, it's a big issue, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think people will be addressing that more uh, moving forward. And, and all kinds of creative ways to do it, right? I mean, you, you re-inject the gas, you right. repurpose the gas, you know, because nobody, you know, flaring kind of has that, it has that sort of negative connotation. In, which I guess. Which yeah. I guess. So, so how do we be, get smart about using that flare right. gas in, in creative ways? As an industry. Yeah. 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 I think for what other rabbit holes do you, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, you're pretty, pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting so far. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know, man. Well, <laughs> do you, believe, I mean, do you think an aliens are good or bad? Kind or evil? I feel like that's like a question about like uh, when, whoever, however someone answers it, it's like a reflection of their, uh, do they believe that the world is fundamentally good or fundamentally evil? Oh, so you take more of the holistic. Yeah, thing. I, okay. I, I, I'm generally a, an optimistic person. I, yeah. I believe in good. I believe that people are mostly good. I do too. You know, and I think, especially even in the context of all the political, you know, all these protests and riots and stuff, I mean, I think, you know, there are people doing bad things, but I think fundamentally, and this is really a function of when you, I, I learned this when you travel. You go to a place where people like, maybe look a lot different, but you realize that, man, they're just, people are just not that different. We, you know what? I, we I, all, that's we all, interesting. You know, I, all, I told uh, my daughter, that's a great, I told my daughter that. I'm like, I was, like, was kind of like talking about kind of, you know, where I've been on stuff. And I was like, you know what's interesting? Like, no matter where you go or how different the culture is, you kind of find out people are kind of more similar than they are. They really are. They're, we have many more similarities than we do have differences. Yeah. And that's true even, if, I think, you know, without setting off a firestorm, I, Republicans and Democrats, they agree on more than that they disagree on, you know, and I think that's true almost in all things. And so I think, I, I, I generally believe that people are good. I believe that, you know, the energy of the universe is good. And yeah. so I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I tend to not be afraid of, uh, you know, invasion. It's a, I think it'd be a cool interaction. Yeah, I do Personal. too. I do too. Um, so uh, you had a couple of uh, uh, interesting, I, well, I kind of want to wrap this up with, uh, let's talk about barbecue. Garmin, right. okay. So let's, 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 let's go into this. What kind of, 
Are you a barbecue man? I am. I have an egg and I have a gas grill. Okay, and that's propane. Or is yes. it water? Okay, no propane. All right. Which do you enjoy using more? I enjoy the egg more, but it takes so much time to get it heated up and get the temperature right, and you know, it, it just you, you have to have like a whole Sunday. So you why know, do you enjoy that more? The process of it. Because it smells better. Okay. I feel like the meat tastes better, you know, and, and, and when you have the time to do it, I enjoy the process when you have the time. But right. It's not like a, a Tuesday night and your wife's like, hey, can you cook some hamburgers? Yeah, I got fired up on the egg. No, you're not going to fire up the egg. You're going to fire up the gas grill and in three minutes it's, it's 700 degrees and you're ready to go, right? Right. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, it's a it's a mix. But you need to try the sous vide. So you're the second person I've heard about this. And, and so tell me how the sous vide So works. sous vide is pretty much <laughs> it's a game changer. Okay. okay. I got into sous vide probably, I started dabbling in about three years ago, really committed to it two and a half years. Okay. So it's pretty much this this thing that you stick in the water and it kind of heats the water up to a certain uh, temperature. Okay. So here at uh, CPC, we've been hosting you know dinners and all that stuff, and you know I'll do you know eight steaks and I'll sous vide or something like that or six steaks, and I'll put it in there for about two hours, and it can compete in my opinion. To I'm not look I'm not here to brag or anything, but right. sous vide is the way to go when it comes to steaks or chicken or anything like that, in my opinion. And so what is it about it that makes it good? Is it the, that you can control it's the temperature better? Or? It's just moist. It's okay. just moist and like then you, then you sear it after. It tastes like a restaurant. Because I guess because the whole the whole cooking process, it's in a bag. Yeah. It's like so so you're, not, you're, not, you're not boiling off the juices nope. and dripping them on the grill. They're, they're all staying, they're all staying, they're staying locked uh, in okay. there, buddy. So there's a demonstrable difference in texture. So oh, if you yeah. put like a, an egg steak next to a sous vide steak, they would, would they look different? I personally think they'll look different. I pers I think I definitely think they'll taste it. Okay. The texture's going to be there. And I mean, it's, if you if you keep the steak in the studio for over two hours, it's going to turn mushy, right? So two hours is the max. Two hours is the max. Okay. Take it, sear it, enjoy it. Set it, forget it, enjoy it. But I, I would I would say though that it does sound like it has a bit more setup time and uh, you know, is it, is it yeah a, you fill something up with water and you and you heat the water up yeah. and you drop the bag in there. Okay. Is there a particular way you have to heat the water up? Is there like a sous vide tool yeah, or is there's it, a sous vide tool? Is that is that the thing that makes it sous vide? Yeah, that's that thing, a big uh, uh, metal thing. Okay. So it's not the bag, it's the actual it's the way it's that it's the bag. Uh, I highly recommend uh, trying it. Okay. Ten bucks, great birthday present for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Is that's, it so okay, so that the real fish now is like is there a specific bag thickness that you have to have or anything like that? That's getting, I mean, too deep. You'll probably dive into that. Maybe <laughs> you'll, you'll, knowing you, you'll probably dive into that, into that mode. Right, I mean, no. I'm just more of a, hey, it tastes good. Zip bag. It tastes good. Zip, zip bag. bag. You know what I'm saying? Zip bag's good enough? Zip okay. bag's good enough. Cool. Just go with that. Cool. Highly recommend it. I'm into it, man. Yeah. What do you use for seasoning? Salt, pepper, salt, pepper, Uncle Chris's steak seasoning, buddy. That's Uncle it. Uncle Chris's. That's it. H-E-B. Okay. 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 Yeah. True to Texas. And, when, and so it's medium rare? Meet, what's your, uh, yeah, I do medium rare. Plus, medium, yeah. medium rare plus. Yeah, well, see, that's that's I'm okay. I'm okay admitting that. You know, I'm okay admitting sometimes I'll do a medium. I'm okay with saying that. Oh, yeah. A lot of people out of yeah. curious are like, it's not, it's not moving or it's not bleeding. Right, right. I'm okay with it. My wife's a medium well steak and she always is, she's always self conscious about it. They're like, don't worry about it. Just, go this, for it. Yeah, if you like it, that's the, if that's how you like if it. If your wife is self conscious, tell her to just take a step back. All right. The president needs it well done with ketchup. Have you heard that? No. Donald, Donald Trump likes his steak well done and he eats it with ketchup. <sighs> Okay, all right, let's, uh, <laughs> I don't that. okay, let's move on. Well, I'd like you to kind of leave us with, uh, with kind of something that you'd like to, 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 a message for our audience, maybe people listen, listening out there, whether uh, they're interested in, you know, whatever, Bitcoin, UFOs, or whether mm. they want to talk to you about sure. a crew change or something like that. I kind of want you, if, if you don't mind, leaving a message for our listeners out there right now. A message, so something like, uh, I don't know what, like a insight, a mm. uh, quote, mm. uh, if you, you had to leave your impression on people right now with, with one, with a little, with a little a pep mm. talk. Oh, jeez, that's a, uh, I don't, be kind. Okay. <laughs> Overall, be kind. I think so, man. I think yeah, you know, I, I think with the uh, you know, the news, there's always seemed like nothing but bad news on the news, and there's. You there's, watch the news a lot. I try not to, man. I've had to try to. I've had to switch it off because it just like it's I'm just. over it. Yeah, way over it. Dude, and honestly, honestly, I'm at the point where it's like ignorance you know, is bliss. Like yeah, it really is. I mean, I'll check. You know, you know. Well, you know, industry-related news, mm -hmm. and that's kind of all on check, just because it just gets shoved down your throat. Yep, you and, you, and it's so hard to know what's real and what's uh, propaganda or what's been kind of inflated or what's been shaded to a particular uh, perspective. And so I think it's important to just, you know, be kind, right? It's, it's easy to want to be uh, uh, judgmental or, it's to, easy or, to look, to, or, or to see someone as an enemy or yeah. as, a, as a combatant. And it's easy to look at our differences versus right. our similarities. Absolutely. And I, I think, think, I think if, you, if you 
you keep focused on differences, it's going to push people apart more. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's going to feed into the whole news more. Absolutely, the social media. Absolutely, yeah. 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 I feel just, just you know, be kind and be patient with people. And I think, uh, and 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 I don't know, give people the benefit of the doubt. I think there's another good one too, right? Yeah. Just uh, and and if we all did that, just just like two percent more, the 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 net impact would be, uh, I think, significant. Well, people need that more now than these days. Absolutely. Ever. I mean, yeah. people are having some tough times right now, yeah. and I think you're right. Showing a little bit of kindness. And, might go along. Unsolicited attaboys. Those are really good. Unsolicited attaboys. Yeah. Just somebody, you know, somebody just say, hey, you know what? I appreciate what you did. Or, you know, somebody does something good, say something out loud, don't take for granted. I think those those things I, I've found in my life, and maybe it's just me, but like uh, somebody appreciating what you do, yep. appreciate when you do a job well done, and, and saying, hey, JP, I you, did, you did a great podcast today, man. It was, that, that was just keeping you going further. It, man, it fuels way, it way more than, than, hey, JP, here's 50 bucks. Good job. You know, or here, here's 50 bucks reward. Like, it's getting, like we're getting the recognition, and, and it doesn't have to be big, you're right, the, whether it's a 5 or just being like, hey, that was really good in there, or yeah. you did a really good job. Yeah, I mean, that, that motivates me more than anything. Way more. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, the, the fear of disappointing someone is a motivator, too. Right. And you work hard, you want to do good, and when somebody recognizes it, it's, there's a... That feels great. Absolutely, it does. That feels great. So I, so I you know, recommend, recommend people to go out there and find somebody, give them, give them an attaboy, unsolicited, give or add a girl. Give them an attaboy, unsolicited, add a girl. And tell them that, uh, and, and, just, and just be kind, man, just, just be, be kind. kind. And nothing's, <laughs> nothing's that serious if you think about it. So, <laughs> all right, well, if anyone has any questions for John, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Good, good time with you, and I enjoyed, enjoyed going down those rabbit holes with you. Um, and again, if anyone has any, has any uh, this is John Hamm, the Executive Sales Manager for Drilling Services at Tally Energy Services. And if anyone has any questions for him um, or myself, or just kind of wants to get in touch with him or myself, you can reach us at Round the Rotary at cap petrocom or you can check out uh, John Hammond, H A M M O N D, at, on uh, on LinkedIn. Just kind of connect with him, say hello. So, John, I appreciate it, man. I wish you all the best, bud. Thanks, JP. All right, buddy. Hey, add a boy today on the podcast. You too, man. Thanks, bud. <laughs>